from the studios of Clean Fuels Alliance America, this is the Better, Cleaner, Now podcast. Authentic conversations with leaders in the biodiesel, renewable diesel, and sustainable aviation fuel industries. Now, here's your host, Scott Tremaine. And welcome. Today, in part one of our two-part series, Clean Fuels CEO Donnell Rehagen sits down with Kenlin Johannes. Well, I'm awful excited uh, to uh, have joining me today Kenlin Johannes. Uh, for those of you listening who uh, don't know Kenlin, Kenlin is commonly referred to as the godfather of biodiesel. So, Kenlin, welcome. Well, thank you, Donnell. It's good to talk to you today. I, it's not often that I get to talk to a godfather, so I'm excited about this, and it's it's great to uh, great to have you on. So. Just wanted to see if we have a great conversation, go back kind of to the beginnings of biodiesel. And I couldn't think of anybody better to involve in a conversation like that than you. Um, as the CEO of Clean Fuels Alliance America today, I know you were at one time the CEO of the National Soy Diesel Development Board. But I know there's a long history that you had with this industry, the soybean industry, farming agriculture that preceded that. So maybe we'll just start back with... Uh, you know, how did you get into agriculture, farming, and then we'll work our way up to uh, what's going on. Well, for sure, Donnell. And it uh, it is kind of a, an interesting story uh, in some ways because, uh, you know, I was born and raised uh, on a farm in Nebraska and uh, did all those things uh, farm sons do, uh, uh, except uh, I didn't help with uh, grade B cow milking very much. Uh, we, we were just phasing out of that, so I was too young to do that. But uh, back in the, the 50s, uh, when I was growing up, it was a completely uh, diversified farm. We had milk cows, we had sheep, we had uh, hogs, we had cattle, uh, we had chickens, a uh, few geese and ducks at, at uh, some time or another. And uh, it was uh, quite a multifaceted farming operation. But, you know, my parents uh, grew and farmed uh, through the Depression and through the 30s. So they had a huge garden, and uh, it was just that type of farm. And it was a huge farm for the time. Um, it was about 260 acres, which is a which was a big farm for uh, for you know the 50s and, and 60s. Uh, and uh, it it kind of laid the foundation uh, that I had good parents uh, who worked hard and uh, taught me what I hope was a good work ethic. And uh, and my father was a joiner too. So um, I went through all the things uh, as a child, uh, 4-H, uh, FFA, I was showing cattle and sheep and at uh, different fairs and shows. And uh, uh, it was um, kind of a very, oh, peaceful, but sometimes boring life, you know, <laughs> out, out on the farm. Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of things to do at the time. So uh, you just learn to uh, make up things and, uh, and be very creative uh, with your play and and the like and uh, I, I really really enjoyed it it was uh it was an excellent time and an, uh, to grow up and uh, an excellent family to grow up in for the very start at least so well there's something about growing up on a farm i think and i did not myself but i mean all the farmers that i've you know come to know over the years there's just this there's this work ethic there's this um willing unwillingness to see things in a negative light i mean there's just optimism all over the place. And so I think, uh, you know, ch children who are lucky enough to grow up on a farm over the years have, have benefited from that. And I think many times it sets them on a great course for, you know, future endeavors as well. So tell me a little bit about where you were in high school and when it was that you got most interested. Of course, you grew up on a farm, but when did you get interested in continuing that as something that you wanted to do for the better part of the rest of your life? Well, uh, it was kind of uh, by perchance, and uh, being a r religious person, I think the Lord might have guided guided some things uh, uh, over the course of my life. I mean, uh, you know, I, in high school, uh, I, you know, played all kinds of sports. It was a small high school, I mean, and I was at the uh, top sixteen in my class. I think, of course, we only had thirty three students uh, in in our graduated <laughs> class, but uh, I almost made it. To the top. Uh, it was it was a uh, it was a great uh, group of. Uh, you know, young men and young women uh, that I grew up with, and we all knew each other. You know, and uh, and from I went to school from kindergarten till twelfth grade with uh, uh, several of the friends that I still have and uh, fish with today and do other activities with today. But uh, um, when uh, 
I graduated from high school, I really didn't know what to do. Uh, and in fact, it was a, it was a kind of tumultuous time uh, in our history. It was uh, right at the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, a lot of people were getting drafted and those types of things. So I decided to go on to college and, and uh, I decided to go into teaching. And uh, so uh, I went to the same school that uh, my sister went to, uh, Concordia Teachers College. It's now Concordia University, Nebraska, in Seward, Nebraska. Uh, my older sister graduated from there. My brother was a teacher, too. Uh, he graduated from Midland in Fremont. And my oldest brother went to the University of Nebraska and got an engineering degree. So we all kind of uh, used our education for Nebraska schools and uh, and so uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, teaching was uh, an occupation that I thought I, I could uh, do very well in. And it was an interesting uh, way to approach public speaking. You know, some people are so afraid of public speaking and talking, whatever. But when you're a teacher and you're standing there and there are anywhere from 20 to 30 kids looking back at you, you better have something to say and you better talk. So, uh, so I, I learned to talk and speak uh, in front of that crowd. And it kind of, uh, and Donnell, you, you talk and you have speeches and stuff like that. Some people are afraid of speaking and sometimes it's a rush really to do public speaking. If you're a good public speaker, you're like, I know you are, and I've seen you on stage and uh, you've addressed uh, people. Uh, it's, it's fun, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, that's where, that's where at least I got part of my personality of <laughs> public speaking and taught school in New Orleans, Louisiana for a couple of years. I went up to Rock Island, Illinois. And uh, taught school there because uh, it was a little more Midwestern-y, you know, and, and more my line of uh, discipline, thought process or whatever. But then uh, something unfortunate happened. Uh, my father passed away at a very young age. Mm. Uh, he was uh, 61 years old when he passed away. And now I see that as being very young. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, many of those that are listening uh, might see that too. But uh, when he passed away, I had a decision to make. My older brother was an engineer and he didn't want to farm and uh, my mother was still on the farm, and my uh, other brother was in California teaching. He had no interest, and sister wasn't at all. So I decided to come back and, and uh, take over the farm. And uh, it was an interesting process. It was in uh, 1974, and uh, it was a time when um, uh, prices were spiked up a little bit, but uh, farming's always a challenge. So that kind of gets me to the farming aspect uh, of a Don L. Uh, I'll get you that far, at least with that question. Well, that I, you know, when you said you were a school teacher, I thought if you can hold a room full of young kids and you can hold their attention for an hour, then you're you're definitely doing something. Well, yes, <laughs> uh, they're kind of have to listen to you, but you still have to command a, a little <laughs> bit of a, a presence that uh, it and and for some reason I related to uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, junior high people, which some people were say bore of the challenge, but uh, but I like it, and I might have actually. I had some student teachers uh, had I continued into teaching uh, in uh, in Illinois, but uh, but you know if, I'll keep going, Don Elk, is uh, when I when I got back to the farm, uh, I think I mentioned earlier my father was a joiner and, and a leader or whatever, and I said there's got to be some things that I need to get engaged in just outside of farming. I raised soybeans and corn. We had some hogs of which I immediately got rid of the swine that was way too complicated for me, kept the cattle and the sheep and kind of stayed somewhat diversified. But uh, I also thought I need to get involved in an education, per, uh, you know, and I mean, involved in advocacy, you know, part of, of farming. So I looked up and found out how to join the Nebraska Soybean Association and uh, I recruited myself as a member. And then I also uh, got engaged with uh, the Farm Bureau. Uh, I couldn't get in Platte County's Farm Bureau, so for some reason I ended up in Colfax County Farm Bureau Board of Directors. And just kind of uh, parlayed that into uh, interaction with other farmers and understanding what was going on. So uh, uh, being that kind of a joiner, that got me engaged. Well, that's so important, too. I mean, we see that in, in our industry here, how the role of industry leaders, you know, to come to sit down beside staff and to help advise staff and lead and direct and provide vision for staff of an association or organization is so important because, you know, we that, and you know, from working in the association world, you can sometimes get really, really focused on the day-to-day -day things that make the association work. And therefore, the industry can sometimes tend to become a second thought if you're not careful. And so I applaud you for 
for that willingness to, to be one of those leaders. We continue today to always need people like that from the industry, whether it's agriculture, in our case, the fuels industry, to sit alongside us and, and be part of the decision-making process that happens. So so how did you – what was your experience there when you got involved with the Nebraska Soybean Association, Soybean Board? What, what was your first experience with that? Well, I – First of all, I had a, a kind of a bit of a mentor. It was my uh, father's uh, cousin, I believe it was. Uh, he had shared some equipment because back in those days, you didn't couldn't always buy a different types of equipment. So he shared equipment with my father, and I kept uh, asking him questions. Well, you know, how in the world do uh, does this this operation? How does the planner work? How does it come? And he always just said, "Just try it. Just try it. Just try it." So that was kind of a, something that always went in the back of my mind. Uh, that, that, you know, you just got to try it. And I think you were talking about farming and, and farmers and, and their whole mindset is you just have to try things. You have to be creative and innovative. And if you don't do it, it doesn't get done <laughs> at all. So it's kind of a whole process of how to conduct yourself. But, you know, getting on to the Nebraska Soybean Association, when I, when I first joined that about two years in, I had heard about the, the soybean checkoff. And I uh, thought, well, what a tremendous I- idea and uh, concept. I hadn't heard of it before. It was being conducted from the beans I sold. But uh, then, you know, I, I looked into it and uh, I said, I'd like to get on this board. Well, it's it's not always so easy to get on those boards back in that day. We were talking about the 70s. You had to get a petition signed by 100 farmers that you were good. And then you had to submit it to, to the governor. It was a gubernatorial appointment. Well, it just happened that uh, I I talked to another one of the farmers that kind of mentored me, and he said, get engaged in politics, you know, and, and uh, a little bit. So I went to the Platte County, you know, uh, Republican uh, convention and got elected as an alternate just kind of because they ran out of people to go and went to the, that convention and met a gentleman by the name of Alan Behrman, who was Secretary of State, who happened to be a fraternity brother of my brother. Well, it all kind of turned inside around, and you can see where I submitted the paperwork, and I told Alan I submitted the paperwork to the governor, and it happened that he recommended that I be appointed to the Nebraska Soybean Checkoff Board. Now, hopefully I explained that well enough. It's it's somewhat convoluted, but as you go through life, there's a couple of things. You have to know a lot, but sometimes it helps to know the right people at the right time, too, and uh, and serendipitously or however it works out, uh, I got appointed to that board. Uh, by that governor. And then uh, I was doing so well with that, uh, that uh, when the political parties changed, you know, I was somewhat bipartisan, but, you know, uh, uh, Bob Carey, who ended up being a senator later, actually reappointed me to the checkoff board from the other political party. I worked well with that and went to the national checkoff board, the precursor of the United Soybean Board. I served on the the, uh, American Soybean Development Foundation. That's that's what it was. That was the organization that preceded the United Soybean War. And I was actually on that executive committee and the American Soybean Executive Committee. So I just kept working and doing that. And I prioritized that, you know, along, along with, with my faith, with my uh, soybeans became one of the top things uh, in addition to trying to earn a living in, in farming. So, uh, so it so again, getting engaged and getting involved, and I loved it. I met a lot of different people. I got to travel a little bit, uh, do some international travel uh, in the eighties, and and uh, you know you get out of an organization what you put into it, and uh, I put in a lot of time into it. I think, and and what it turned out to do is when in the nineteen eighties, uh, when interest rates, people think interest rates are going to go high now. Farming interest rates when the twenty percent interest rates you had to if you had to borrow for seed or feed or whatever it was 20 percent. so at that time i said i'm not losing the farm i can't make this anymore uh you know it's just just not going to work uh i don't want to lose the land so uh i applied and got the wisconsin soybean association position because of my teaching skills i volunteered for a local government agency and i worked with the soybean farmers in the soybean industry and it all kind of parlayed to uh to really create and start the Wisconsin corn and soybean program. So kind of long-winded, Donnell, but that, that's what got me into this uh, this business of a trade association. Well, that was that that was the transition. That's what I was going to ask you about. So what was it that led you from the farm into association work, which is to me some you know, very related in the sense of trying to 
take care of other people. And farming is, to me, about taking care of other people. It's about feeding other people. And, of course, association work is looking after the needs of others, your members. And so so you ended up from, from your Nebraska farm to the Wisconsin Soybean Board then, and that got you into the Soy Association leadership. Is that right? Well, yeah, that got me uh, as a, a trade association executive. There so, you go. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we we want to uh, start the count or whatever, but as, as I looked back over the course of time, I was either a farmer board member, a uh, executive director, or a founder uh, of some sort, a leader in 18 different agriculture trade associations over the course of my time and, and uh, wow. uh, working in this industry. So it, it started with the two in Nebraska, Wisconsin was four, we're up to six. And so, so it kind of, it kind of built from there, obviously sometimes multiple organizations uh, at the same time. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it was almost shocking to me too, by the time I looked at it from, you know, about Missouri, it will get to Missouri, Texas, Kansas, uh, Canola, uh, all, all kinds of uh, opportunities came from, forth from this uh, first opportunity and I, and I have to thank my wife and my family for kind of pulling up the roots uh, my, of course my wife was a missionary's daughter so she was used to traveling she wasn't necessarily a, someone who hadn't lived in a lot of different places more than I had uh, during the course of my time and so it so it, that made it a lot easier to the support of my family uh, as uh, as as we moved on to Wisconsin so it was it was, it was pretty exciting started with a uh, a uh, Card table in an, in an empty apartment with the telephone, trying to find some place to locate the office. So that's how things like that get started. Now you mentioned Missouri. I think Missouri and your your role in Missouri soybeans was probably what led you into the biodiesel industry. So tell us a little bit about what happened when you got to Missouri and how things changed. Sure, sure. It's uh, uh, the Wisconsin. I, I stayed in the Wisconsin position for two years, and then uh, the Missouri position came open. That I consulted with you know, with my wife, or whatever. And of course, Wisconsin's a fairly decent soybean producing state, more so now as as our productions increase. But uh, Missouri was in the top uh, five, I believe it was, of uh, soybean producing states at the time. And I said, so I knew some people there, but uh, you know, I knew what I was doing. You know, I knew some of the board members that were sitting on the board with the American Soybean Development Foundation, American Soybean Association, and the like. So I asked them, and I applied, and yes, I did get the uh, Missouri uh, position <clears throat> in 1988. So uh, that uh, that opened a new uh, opportunity for me uh, to uh, um, a much larger state, uh, much more influential state, and uh, again, great farmers. It's always the farmers that are the ones that are engaged. And again, it was a checkoff organization and an association. And having been a checkoff board member myself, and I approached that uh, in all my different tenures as I handled two added states, as they call them, I uh, knew the checkoff was was very important, but it couldn't exist without uh, the association. And and we found that out, uh, uh, you know, late last year when uh, uh, the. American Soybean Association had to fend off an amendment uh, to kind of dissolve all the checkoffs, including the United Soybean Board and, and Congress. So, you know, that was that was clear back in September. So, so uh, that uh, the checkoff and the association had the opportunity to work together, and I made sure and made sure in every state I went to that they did work together. So, uh, yeah, it, it was a fantastic opportunity to get get to Missouri, and I, I love Jeff City. That was it. So it's a great city. Well, that, that would be around the same time that this whole idea of trying to do something with soybean oil became a very prominent concern for the soybean industry. And I know you played a huge role in trying to help find some larger scale commercial uh, market for soybean oil. So tell me about the your, your work at Missouri Soybean and how that parlayed itself into you know a role with uh, the, the biodiesel industry. Well, uh, again, it kind of worked out. I mean, the checkoff is there to do, you know, a research uh, for uses and research for, uh, uh, you know, growing the crop itself. And it's there for market development. So it's it's uh, very, oh, not unique, but it, but that, that, that makes sense. That's the way uh, the checkoff need to operate and it needs to operate with all those uh, different facets uh, in place. Uh, what happened is, uh, you know, of course, we had a great uh, relationship with the University of Missouri-Columbia. 
uh, because they, they did a lot of the production research, and that's about the main research that was being done. I, as I travel from state to state, I always told uh, the American Soybean Association, and uh, then it was the American Soybean Development Foundation, that, look, if you bring somebody into my, my state, which was Missouri, let me know what's going on. You know, uh, let, me, let me know you're here and what you're doing and things like that. So, so uh, in uh, 1990, a gentleman by this, Stu Ellis, uh, who I happened to meet uh, at a uh, farm broadcasters meeting <laughs> about a year ago, uh, came down, he was working for the American Soybean Association and had a paper that was written by the University of Missouri, um, oh, I believe it was their economics department, uh, indicating that they had just been over to Europe. And uh, they had looked at uh, uh, canola being raised there. Of course, it's called rapeseed over there. And, uh, and taking the oil from that, you know, the feed to feed and, and the oil, uh, and making it uh, into a, a fuel. <laughs> whatever diesel B or I think they were called it all kinds of uh, different uh, names that we weren't used to but and uh, they were looking at an, an alternative crop what the, the results of that uh, that paper were let's let's have an alternative crop here for our farmers to grow well remember back I said uh, I left farming in the mid 80s prices were low interest rates were high well prices were still bad in the mid 80s I mean uh, you know just terrible they hadn't changed much in fact, I think beans were in the three dollars. The soybean oil was in ten cents a pound, and I said, "Well, if you're going to raise another oil seed crop, why in the world wouldn't soybean oil work for this?" So I contacted, uh, you know, uh, our contacts at the University of Missouri Columbia, and uh, they said, "Well, uh, oh, uh, yeah, uh, maybe we uh, should should be looking into soybean oil and 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 the like." And so uh, they sent me to uh, their Department of Ag Engineering. A gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Frisbee was in charge of it at the time, and uh, he uh, put me in touch with a guy that turned out to be a great person for the industry, Dr. Leon Schumacher. Uh, came to our board, uh, called me up, and we started a conversation. So what we could do, what we couldn't. And then he ended up submitting a proposal uh, to the Missouri Soybean Merchandising Council uh, that late uh, 1990. And then, uh, as uh, we might get into <laughs> The next step is uh, what that project was, uh, how it got funded in 1981. So, well, it's amazing. You know, it's, it's just another example of how you put kind of like minds, folks that are focused on trying to do something good, uh, do something good for other people, do something good for other industries. You put them together and give themselves a challenge to to figure this thing out, and things start to materialize. So it's now it's you, it's Leon Schumacher, so it's University of Missouri, Columbia, it's. Missouri Soybean Association, the board, the checkoff, all of that sort of coming together to say, hey, can we can we actually make this happen? And so, you know, take it from there. Where where what were those steps then that were happening as you worked through the hey, can we actually make this happen phase? Well, it, it took a little faith from uh, Leon Schumacher to say that uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this a try. So. Uh, uh, he submitted a proposal, first of all, to kind of have semi-trucks driving across uh, on the Interstate 70, you know, across Missouri and trying to do some testing. And that was way too expensive. And the board was a bit uh, iffy about this concept anyway. I mean, they, they had to be a bit of visionaries. And I've always said that I've uh, spent uh, millions and hundreds of millions of dollars and uh, never even had a vote on a lot of the things that happened. I just had to facilitate it. I helped them figure it out, and I had to help them figure this one out too. Let's 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 take a chance on it. So Leon got uh, actually university bought a 1991 Dodge, uh, and they uh, uh, Leon retrofitted it so it could use um, what we call soy diesel at the time uh, in that vehicle year round. So he heated the fuel, he drove it all over, and uh, and uh, did did a lot of different things with it. So that was the really the first start of it. But then. Uh, uh, there was this one nosy guy uh, who just kept calling different universities all the time. He was act, that was actually was a Mizzou grad by the name of Bill Ayers, and he called uh, the University of Missouri and just said, "Hey, what's going on?" What you know, he was just always snooping around. He was always a you know a very creative alternative fuels and alternative uh, energy uh, kind of guy, and he found out they were uh, they were going to you know have this project, and uh, he said, "Well, I can make the fuel for that." And that you know, all you do is, you know, to remove the glycerin from uh, from the oil. That's we found out that's what it was, because uh, 
you know, note to self, back uh, when I was on the soybean board in Nebraska, the American Soybean Association did a test on using soybean oil in diesel engines. They ran, you know, the thousand-hour tests and those types of things, and uh, uh, they were dismal failure, you know, because you can't just burn soybean oil in a diesel engine. Well, maybe you can change any, I, I don't know, I, I'm not that technical about that, but it just didn't work. But I had that kind of in the back of my mind, well, if this is something different, Maybe this can be done, and maybe we can do it. The 1970s, there were, there were the energy crisis, peak oil. I mean, we were going to run out of oil in the 1990s, and we had to have all different types of fuels, and there's embargoes, and, and so ethanol got its start in the 70s, kind of based as a replacement fuel uh, and the like. And uh, uh, as it turned out, there was a nice footprint there, or a nice uh, that we could uh, use for uh, biodiesel to make diesel fuel out of uh, soybean. Uh, crop and uh, we kind of use that uh, that template. So uh, again, Leon had the truck moving, and and uh, Bill Ayers agreed to make some fuel, and uh, and uh, then we started to get a lot more requests into Missouri. And the truck had to go here and there, and people wanted to see it, and so uh, they decided in 1992, uh, in February, to buy uh, old Brownie, a 1992 Ford uh, F-150 diesel tan and brown the beautiful vehicle put a <laughs> tank on the back uh, in the back with uh, that would hold a 100 you know biodiesel or soy diesel as we called it at the time so we could drive great distances with it so uh so that is the truck that uh, clean fuels alliance america found very employee uh, has made famous over the course of time as he drove that thing all over the state of missouri and then sometimes out of the state of missouri just to try to promote uh uh, we'll call it biodiesel now. Well, something so. like that is is really important in the early stages of trying to convince other people that you have a worthwhile idea when they can really you know put their hands on it, they can touch it, they can feel it, they can see it. That's different than having people just tell them, "Yeah, it's going to work, it's going to work." And if I remember right, and I've seen the pictures of old Brownie, I've I've uh, I've been around her, uh, you know, in her in her waning days, I think, but uh, I saw some early pictures, I want to say, of her on the on or around the steps of the Capitol, the U.S. Capitol. Is that right? <laughs> well, yes. As as word got out that we were working, you know, on this uh, biodiesel, uh, soy diesel uh, effort, uh, people started contacting uh, me. And in fact, I had to tell the board of directors, we got to do something about this because this is, this is taking up, you know, I'm, we have a full program here, and this is taking up over 50% of my time answering all these questions, doing all this again. West, and it just got to way too big uh, for Missouri. So the board said, okay, see what the national people uh, want to do with it. Uh, the United Soybean Board, Congress had just passed the uh, act uh, and order for collection of a national checkoff, which started September 1st of 1991. Hence, there's your time frame. Now we just got the pickup in 1990 and 92, and, and uh, th- there was a greater amount of source of funds, and they were looking for uh, creative ideas and, you know, and continuing the programs that the American Soybean Association and others were doing. And then the American Soybean Association itself, you know, was a very Washington-based organization. So uh, a gentleman uh, by the name of Bill Holmberg uh, knew Bill Ayers, and they talked or whatever. So Bill Holmberg uh, said, hey, drive that thing. He said, Bill and I drive that thing to uh, Washington, D.C., we stopped in Ohio, and uh, we stopped in Illinois first, and then in Ohio, and did a little demonstrations and showed people how it worked but then we got to washington dc and bill holmberg i had lined up uh meetings with the epa the department of energy uh the department of agriculture i mean he knew all these people because he had worked with ethanol in the past and he was really you know jumped on this uh very quickly and was uh, was a uh, you know, visionary too i guess i guess we were visionaries at the time well we'll call it that but then he also got us a uh, audience, so to speak, with Boyden Gray, who was uh, George, the first George Bush's uh, president energy advisor. Clayton Yider was the secretary of agriculture. So he got us right on the White House grounds. We drove through the gates and it was sitting in the parking lot where all the, you know, the, you can't even get that close to anything anymore <laughs> like you could back then. But they were out there with a the hood up looking at the thing and everything else. And we took some pictures right in front of the of the White House and around the Capitol and buildings and stuff like that. And, in fact, uh, South Dakota had done a little bit of uh, testing with their uh, bus transit system in Sioux Falls uh, with the Fruitsy, believe it or not. Took some biodiesel from Italy, and how that all came together, I don't really know. But So Senator Dashold was very interested. 
Uh, Missouri Senator Bond became very interested. So again, the, the synergies of the people, the farmers knew all the politicians, the politicians were becoming somewhat interested. Remember, we wanted to less dependence on foreign oil. The Clean Air Act had just been passed. This was a cleaner burning fuel. The Energy Policy Act had just been passed. So all of these things were kind of lining up to try and help us. But uh, it was too big for Missouri. Uh, and so we they we just uh, formed an ad hoc group because I'd stopped in Ohio, I'd stopped in Illinois, South Dakota was interested, Nebraska, whatever, called the National Soy Fuels Advisory Committee. And uh, that was the first Structuralized is another word <laughs> organization uh, that was supposed to take a look at this. What in the world is going on here? What do we have? What can we do? How should we proceed? Well, so Kenlin, you, you've got all these questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've determined there's widespread interest. So there's a growing interest. Uh, pockets of interest on Capitol Hill and everywhere else. Seems like there's things moving. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap things up for today. But, Ken, I'd love it if you would uh, come back and join me next week oh, and we yeah. can pick up this conversation. There's a lot still out there. You know, I want to talk about the development of the trade association, the early years of the biodiesel industry, some of the early leaders, some of the early pioneers who helped us get to where we are today. So would you be able to uh, come back and join me next week? Sure. I'd love to join you again, Donnell. All right. Thank you, Donnell and Kenlin. That's it for this week's episode, but join us next week for part two with Kinlan and Don L. If you enjoy the podcast and you've got a moment, it really does help us if you give us a rating. It helps us get higher up on the lists. And if you really want to go for it, just leave us a review. We might just read it here. You can do that wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a question for our experts or a suggestion for a future topic or guest, you can email us at podcasts at cleanfuels.org. And join us next week for another episode of the Better Cleaner Now podcast. Thanks for listening. Better Cleaner Now is a production of Clean Fuels Alliance America. Follow us at cleanfuels.org and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. For more information on Clean Fuels Alliance America, visit us at cleanfuels.org.